Today, central banks in Wonderland. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analysis Web, and that is Post, covering finance and property news. Well, quite a lot of central bank related news today. The Bank of Canada, for example, raised interest rates for a second straight meeting, pushing back the timeline for inflation's return to target while revising growth upward. Policymakers led by Governor Tiff Macklem increased the overnight lending rate on Wednesday by 25 basis points to 5%. That's the highest in 22 years. The move was expected by most economists, with an odds of around 75%. The bank provided little guidance on the future path of borrowing costs, but reiterated that it remains resolute in its commitment to achieving price stability. In the accompanying monetary policy report, officials forecast inflation would stay around 3% for next year, before gradually declining to the 2% target in mid-2025. That's two quarters later than previous projections. And the economy is seen averaging around 1% growth in the second half of this year and the first half of 2024. That's an upward shift from the stall expected earlier. The bank now predicts the output gap will close nine months later than previously anticipated sometime early next year. The substantial forecast adjustments illustrate why policymakers restarted their tightening campaign in June. The central bank's attempt to pause interest rates earlier this year proved untenable in the face of stubborn price pressures and surprisingly robust consumption growth. But delaying the return to price stability suggests the bank is struggling with its primary job, even as higher inflation expectations risk becoming further entrenched. Policymakers decided to hike in the light of the accumulation of evidence that excess demand and elevated core inflation are both proving more persistent and taking into account its revised outlook for economic activity and inflation, the bank said in the statement. The rate hikes highlight the challenges faced by the central bankers around the world as they try to nail down how high borrowing costs will need to rise in order to fully rein in price pressures. Officials of the Federal Reserve are saying US rates will still need to go higher, despite a slightly lower inflation readout today as well. And the European Central Bank isn't done hiking yet. And the Bank of England's policy is becoming, well, it's a national obsession in the UK, I think. Macklin and his officials remain concerned that progress towards the 2% target could stall, jeopardising the return to price stability, and will be closely watching excess demand, inflation expectations, wages growth, and corporate pricing behaviour. And the statement reiterates the Bank of Canada's commitment to getting inflation all the way back down to the 2% target, but notes that there are challenges ahead. The next stage in the decline of inflation towards target is expected to take longer and is more uncertain, the bank said in the monetary policy report, citing elevated prices for services and uncertainty about expected inflation as key reasons. The latest revision to the inflation outlook is due to more persistent excess demand and higher than expected home and tradable goods prices, the bank said, adding that a key upside risk is inflation expectations could prove more stubborn. And the bank said that the stickiness of core inflation in Canada suggests that inflation may be more persistent than originally thought, and that a similar pattern also exists in other economies. So policymakers see a tight labour market, accumulated household savings, pent-up demand for services, government spending and strong population growth from higher levels of immigration as key factors leading to the unexpected strength of household spending in the first half of the year. In fact, spending on rate-sensitive goods, such as furniture, clothing and recreational equipment, was surprisingly strong. And based on recent data, strength in goods consumption seems to have continued while spending on services has been robust, according to the report. Greater excess demand and more stubborn core inflation are sustaining underlying price pressures, the bank said. Slowing domestic demand is central to the anticipated decline in inflationary pressures. But of course, all central banks are faced with the fact that those base effects which dropped out from a year ago and helped inflation in the short term are now being reversed. So inflation is going to be stickier and higher for longer. Now, the Bank of England also today warned that some 4 million households will face a sharp increase in mortgage costs, with the average borrower paying almost £3,000 a year more. 
Governor Andrew Bailey said on Wednesday that the surge in mortgage rates will have an impact clearly on finances as the central bank's financial stability report predicts that one million households face a £500 plus hike in monthly repayments. There will still be consequences from increased interest rates, I'm afraid, because from a monetary policy perspective, that's why we have to do it, Bailey said at a press conference in London following the report. However, he said that households and firms are less likely to slash spending and default on debt than previous periods of high rates. The assessment of the report underscores the strain from the quickest series of rate rises in three decades, with trouble among buy-to-let landlords, in other words investors, highlighted as a threat to house prices. The action is meant to slow the economy and rein in inflation, but will bring real pain for consumers already coping with the tightest squeeze in living standards in generations. The issue is becoming a key battleground between the UK's two main political parties ahead of the next election, which is widely expected next year. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's government has been looking for ways to ensure that savers benefit from higher interest rates and give borrowers flexibility in restructuring their finances. The Bank of England said that a typical household rolling off a fixed rate deal in the second half of 2023 face a £220 a month increase in their mortgage costs based on a current rate equivalent of £2,640 a year. By the end of 2026, about 1 million households will have seen their payments go up by more than £500 a month. This assumes they refinance at the same maturity, but about 15% of mortgagees have extended the length of their loans, and some are repaying using their savings, which reduces the quantity of loans that they are refinancing. It will take time for the full impact of higher interest rates to come through both in the UK and in other advanced economies, Bailey said. Elements of the global financial system do remain vulnerable to interest rates. The warning comes after money facts revealed that the average rate for fixed two-year home loans rose to 6.66% in the UK, the highest since August 2008. The pain for homeowners could get even worse with markets pricing in a peak bank rate of almost 6.5% to tackle sticky inflation. However, the Bank of England's report and comments suggest that financial stability concerns will not stand in the way of further interest rate rises. Bailey said that for now, both borrowers and lenders are in better condition to shoulder difficulty than they were in previous rate cycles. Compared to previous periods of high interest rates, households and businesses are just likely to cut back on spending and default on loans, Bailey said. More broadly, the UK economy and financial system has so far been resilient to interest rate risk. The amount all households will have to pay out on mortgage costs will climb to about 8% of their post-tax income by 2026, up from 6.2%. However, it is still well below the peak seen in the global financial crisis and the early 1990s recession. And Deputy Governor John Cunliffe also revised his warning from a year ago that 5% rates could drive households into levels of debt distress similar to the financial crisis. Now he suggests the pain threshold is more likely to be 8% and said that a year ago he envisioned 5% as the bottom end of the range where many consumers get into trouble. So a little bit of revisionism going on here. And talking of revisionism, down in Australia, well, it's more about moving the deck shares on the Titanic, in my view, because the number of Reserve Bank of Australia board meetings will be cut to eight from 11 from next February. And post-meeting press conferences will commence, according to an address given by the RBA Governor Phil Lowe. And it also could well be his final speech before his future is revealed. As markets await an imminent announcement from Treasurer Jim Chalmers on whether Dr Lowe will be replaced in September, the central bank chief revealed significant changes in the operation of the institution on Wednesday, including that a slimmed-down schedule of eight board meetings would take effect from February 2024. Economists were uncertain about when the changes, which were among the 51 recommendations, including the independent review of the central bank, would come into a force. Dr Lowe's speech actually came just hours after Treasurer Jim Chalmers revealed he would take his recommendation to Cabinet soon about whether Dr Lowe will be replaced when his term ends in September. 
there'll be a cabinet discussion before long about it and then ideally I would make an announcement immediately after that he told ABC Radio on Wednesday. Asked about his future Dr Lowe said he would be honoured to continue in his role otherwise he would do it best to support his successor. The government has not ruled out speculation that the announcement could be made later in this week before Dr Chalmers and Dr Lowe fly together on Sunday to India for a G20 meeting of finance ministers and central bank governors. Dr Chalmers said he had a preliminary discussion with Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor about the decision. Contenders considered by close RBA observers to be possible successors to Dr Lowe are Deputy Governor Michelle Bullock, Department of Finance Secretary Jenny Wilkinson and Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy, although those political connections probably are needed by the government, so they may not be that valid. The RBA board has for months considered how to implement the recommendations of the independent review, which was commissioned by Treasurer Jim Chalmers and delivered back in April. Once all the changes are implemented, Dr Lowe or his successor will oversee an institution that more closely resembles other advanced economy central banks, which of course have done so well, haven't they? Four of the eight annual board meetings will be on the first Tuesday of February, May, August and November. The remaining four meetings will be held midway between those meetings. Interest rate decisions will still be released at 2.30pm and a press conference will be held at 3.30pm after each meeting. Now other central bankers of course hold press conferences but I have to tell you that most of the questioning is pretty benign and some of the people who would ask more pointy questions don't seem to be let in. Although Dr Lowe was sceptical of the review's sharp criticism of current board members' suitability to set interest rates, he said that as times change, we too need to change. The world we face is increasingly complex and it's right to re-examine how we make and communicate monetary policy decisions and how the RBA is managed, he told the Australian Conference of Economists in Brisbane on Wednesday. And future RBA board meetings will be longer than are currently the case, Dr Lowe said, while board members will also have the opportunity to attend the internal staff policy discussion that happens in advance of the board meeting. The less frequent and longer meetings will provide more time for the board to examine issues in detail and have deeper discussions on monetary policy strategy, alternative policy options and risks, as well as on communication, Dr Lowe said. And he also revealed that the central bank's monetary policy framework would undergo a comprehensive review every five years. That was previously, there was previously no requirement for a review, and the independent review released in April was actually the first in 40 years. The most significant structural change recommended by the review was the creation of two boards, one with monetary policy experts who set interest rates, and the other a governance board. Dr Lowe said that the fact the central bank would only have two of the nine votes on interest rate decisions was unusual by international standards. In almost every other central bank, most of the decision makers are insiders. That is, they spend the bulk of their time inside the central bank. In our case, only two of the nine board members are insiders, Dr Lowe said. The other seven spend the bulk of their time outside the RBA, and this will remain the case. This is a significant difference between the RBA and other central banks. And in future, the board will issue the post-meeting statement and be the signatory of the statement on the conduct of monetary policy, Dr Lowe said, rather than the governor. And the board will also oversee the central bank's research agenda. The central bank's quarterly forecasts, which are released in February, May, August and November, will be released alongside the outcome of that month's board meeting, rather than three days later. And Labour is expected to introduce legislation into Parliament towards the end of the year for any changes that require amendments to the Reserve Bank Act, including changing the bank's mandate to removing the power for the government to overrule the RBA on interest rates, which I have argued previously is a nonsense idea, because ultimately there needs to be accountability, and that is through Parliament. Dr Lowe said that some other recommendations, including a move to publishing unattributed vote counts at board meetings and allowing board members to make speeches about interest rates, should be acted upon once legislation to amend the Reserve Bank Act has passed Parliament. This will avoid the current board locking the new board into a particular approach, Dr Lowe said. Now some Labour backbenchers want Dr Lowe replaced because of the central bank's errant guidance on 2024 interest rates, though they have not been actively lobbying the Treasurer for his removal. And by the way, on, on Tuesday, Westpac announced that it had poached Assistant RBA Governor Lucy Ellis 
to succeed veteran Bill Evans as its chief economist in October, marking the first high-level vacancy at the RBA since the release of the review. The RBA will advertise externally and internally replace Dr Ellis amid criticisms in the review that the central bank was at risk of groupthink due to its lack of external hires at senior levels. Dr Lowe said the RBA was embarking on a significant programme of cultural change as a, view of the res- as a result of the review, and more management vacancies will be advertised externally amid criticisms from the review about the central bank's insular culture. Dr Lowe said the outlook for inflation had worsened since the central bank's May forecast was prepared. However, he said there was a series of cross-currents pulling inflation in different directions. More strong growth in unit labour costs is an upward risk to inflation, a normalisation of supply change and falling commodity prices were helping the central bank engineer a return to its 2-3% to inflation target. So if you put the whole discussion in Australia about the way that the Reserve Bank is going to run its board meetings, compared with what the Bank of England is looking at in terms of pressures on households and financial stability, and the Bank of Canada, who is actually continuing to lift rates, and even the inflation read in the US. I have to say, I think the RBA is moving the deck chairs on the Titanic rather than addressing the critical issues they should have been. And I must say that I think many central bankers are living in Wonderland, a parallel universe that is a million miles from many real households and businesses. This is something which is not going to end well. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.